Hey gamers, Maniac here at Gaming Sista on that doing a special video review from a blast from the past. As of recently, I've been reading a lot of articles online which have been detailing the history of Palm Computing. Now, some of you guys may remember Palm Inc. as those guys that developed the Palm Pre or the Palm Pixie smartphone a couple of years ago, which didn't exactly do too well when it hit market. And since then, they were bought by HP, released a tablet that didn't really do too well, and then we open so they open sourced what they had. Here's the beauty of it. Palm actually probably was one of the most successful companies of its time when it came to computing. It was actually a revolutionary company. Way, way back even before the Pre or the Pixie came out. They were the first people to really be able to revolutionize personal digital assistants. And to me, there never was a more iconic personal digital assistant release than what I've got right here. And I went to Church in for it right after I saw these articles and I found it. I'm glad to show it to you. Still got it. This right here. The Palm 7. Actually, this is the Palm 7X. Wow, I didn't even know that. This right here, this bad boy. You're probably asking yourself, what the heck is this thing? This was one of the early models of Palms, but this was released at a time when they were just in their heyday. It, to me, actually, this is a protective case for it, it, to me, actually met the form factor, and I'll take a closer look at it in just a couple of seconds, but to me, this particular form factor is the definitive Palm form factor. I know that they switched the whole look of it when they started releasing models shortly after this one got released, uh, in particular, probably around the time that the M series came out. This was like the last model that they released before they started doing the M-Series and changed the form factor to something a little bit more stout, a little bit wider at the top and that sort of thing. But this is a very similar appearance to the Palm 3, um, the original Palm Pilot, and it's got a lot of the same features of those early models as well as a lot of features that are unique specifically to this device or would only be added in, later, in earlier devices through upgrades or new hardware updates. So, we're going to talk a little bit about this, and I'm going to give my honest review of it. So, let's talk about it, shall we? Here's a close-up of the Palm 7X right here. And let me tell you something. I always consider this a very iconic image. Um, it's a very similar form factor to some of the earlier models of the Palms. Like I said, they switched it later on, but to me, this is what a Palm always looked like. I got a protective carrying case right here. This is custom specifically for this model um, that I liked a lot. It's held in place with the Velcro strap that got an extra stylus as well. Um, it's got a monochrome uh, 160 by 160 screen, and as you can see down here is a power button and a couple of interface buttons in order to mess around with it, uh, particularly to boot up specific programs. As you can see here, there's a writing pad here for the graffiti writing system. For people who may be uh, better off writing shorthand instead of uh, typing out on a, gr uh, a virtual keyboard that may be displayed on the screen, um, you would actually have, you can use your stylus and write, basically just write on the pad um, in shorthand whatever you'd want to type out on the screen. And if you want to have a little size comparison, uh, that's an iPhone 4 right there. They're pretty much about the same size. So it's pretty cool here. As you can also see, there's some little strap right here next to it. This is actually the antenna. There is a full antenna that's only operational um, when the uh, antenna is enabled or extended is like this, which connected to the antiquated Palm Net service, palm.net. From there, pretty much anywhere across my country, um, I could, as long as I had that antenna up, I could access my own email account remotely. Um, I had my own PalmNet uh, email address way back in the day, as well as use PalmNet applications wirelessly. And there were plenty of PalmNet applications. Nowadays, we'd call those apps. Um, here, right here, you can see this is the docking cradle for it. You could put the apps on the um, on the on the uh, the PDA specifically by attaching it to the computer and just resting it like this. And this right here is what would go inside the computer. This is a COM port connection, actually. I have seen that they did certainly make some USB models of the docking cradles. 
but um, the research that I've done with this hasn't confirmed if those docking cradles were compatible with this particular model or the earlier ones. But then again, um, they were released at around the same time. There certainly was you were certainly were was a USB docking cradle available at the time I had this, and I'm fairly certain that maybe there might be one model out there that um, uses this port standard and is USB compatible. As you can see back here, this thing does not have an internal chargeable battery. It actually runs off of uh, two AAA batteries, actually, which I will demonstrate here. Um, the downside of this is, and it always has been, that, um, well, basically, this thing has base only internal flash memory. It doesn't have a solid state memory of its own or any other type of memory uh, compartment that you can use to store um, anything saved. Because of that, whatever would happen was if your battery died, you'd, prob you'd have a gratis period of about 15 seconds, I'm sorry, 15 minutes um, internal battery charge to um, basically replace them. If you didn't, all the memory that would be inside your palm, and as you can see here, it's already loaded up the start menu, um, all your memory would be, uh, would be wiped. Here's some of the initial setup right here. Um, as you can see here, it needs requires an automatic calibration. So let's say we do this. It actually has a response. I took it out of the case because I got to get to the stylus in the back in order to um, to do this. As you can see on the top, actually, there's also an infrared port. Um, back then, actually, infrared ports were quite common on laptops, um, although most people weren't using them um, because it was a lot easier to just have. It, the idea behind the infrared ports were was that. Um, they just simply wanted you to use, let's say, a, I don't know, um, USB or any other type of Ethernet or wi later wireless connections would just be faster. So what would happen instead was, was that people just used those and they didn't bother with the infrared ports. Well, the palms actually, because they were so small, worked perfectly, it worked better. And as you can see here, for a 120, I'm sorry, for a 160 by 160 screen, Look at, look at the date on this. It's all the way back to 2000. Uh, that's not a capacitance. Oh, actually, I think it might be. This is not. This is probably a similar type screen that what we would see on a uh, 3DS um, or the Wii U. This is not a kind of screen that you would normally see on a. Okay. I actually don't even know what time it is. <laughs> Hold on, I'm pulling it up. And this is the basic home screen. As you can see here, if I may have a comparison. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Four basic functions down here. And other options that you can scroll to. In this case, you scroll down for them. In this case, you'll scroll to the side. But that's basically it. Um, it actually has a very good response time. Yeah, that's kind of an Achilles heel actually with this thing. It does, once it's been reused, it has to... Um, And this is the graffiti pad. As I said, it does use its own particular uh, graffiti language. 
Still works just as well as the day I got it. And in case you guys are curious, I know that uh, some people actually might be, so I'll just um, write it down or show it. Okay, no utilities. Okay, not what I was expecting. Um... Oh, here we go. And as you can see here, this is using version 3.5. I believe there were a few minor point revisions for this particular model after the fact it might have gone as high as 3.5.3, I don't remember. Or as far as I know, I might have actually up, been able to update this thing to version 3.5 from version 3. Um, however, it was made available at around the same time that the M series was launching. Palm was announcing their initiative to do version 4 of the Palm operating system and all the new features that came with it. I specifically remember getting an email saying that they would be willing to sell me a CD with the Palm 4 operating system to basically put on here. Um, don't know if if that was how, ac how well my memory is on that, but it, I would believe that that would certainly possibly be possible. However, Palm did recommend to me that I just simply toss this in the trash and buy a M series or something along those lines, which would already have four pre-installed. But let me tell you something. I had some good times with this, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. So that's pretty much what this thing can do. This is just a quick little run-through of all the stuff that's on there. But, I mean... It had a pretty good, re you know, for what it is, it had a fantastic response time. Let's see how well this does in the pocket test, shall we? We got a pocket. <laughs> see how well it fits. Perfect. I had some really good times with this thing. Okay, let me paint a picture for all of you guys. These came out in 2000. It was just around the heyday of the PDA. Before the Palm came, before Palm came on the market, PDAs were being released. People were developing them. Companies were developing them. Handwriting recognition software was being released. Apple had released their new. And the problem was was that they were all overpriced and they were terribly designed, um, both from a performance standpoint and interface standpoint, and a few other problems. People like to build these things like they were a PC or something along those lines. They want. They thought that people wanted a lot of features. Based upon the research that I've done on these things, the reason why this thing thrived was because it was minimalistic. And because of that, the performance was fantastic. It used very few batteries. And when it did use batteries, they lasted quite a while. Um, it didn't do a lot of features or as many features, but what it did do for features were pretty much the basic needs of what people needed. They needed a calendar. They needed a date book. They needed a planner. All of that simple stuff. And, but for me, what made this service so great was the Palm Net service. I was getting apps in 2000. Be, they weren't even called apps on this thing. Yes, I'd have to transfer them manually using the docking cradle, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. But the way it worked was I could download uh, and sync an app to this thing from my computer and have all the information that I needed in order to travel. I could download a Delta application to this thing. And the second I got into the airport, I'd have, all I'd have to do is give it my flight number, I'd have the gate information, I'd have the uh, location information of the gate, I'd have all the up-to-date information about the, uh, the status of the flight, and I'd find out if there was a meal being served on the flight. I flew all over the country with this thing one summer. It worked all the time. And I was able to send and receive email wirelessly. Now, I know what you're saying. We can do that right now with our cell phones. Heck, we can do that right now, especially with the smartphones. Yeah, you're right. Cell phones back then were nowhere near as good as they were right now. And I don't know if a lot of people knew that cell phones were going to be as great as they turned out to be. 
I think that there were some people at the cusp of the Palm generation, some of the Palm founders in particular, that knew that cell phone integration with Palm integration was pretty much inevitable. Um, because a cell phone was so portable, uh, it basically that this thing and a cell phone was going to merge. But at the time, we didn't even have text messaging. At the time, if we had cell phones, they were these, you know, they had flips, they had the antenna you had to raise up. Um, they only worked part of the time. Okay, well, that's still true. Um, <laughs> they, the batteries didn't last very long. Okay, well, that's still true. Um, and they were very, very, very expensive to operate. They had keypads on them that were very similar to the calculator keypads. And they had um, displays on them that were also very similar to, key, to, to, to calculators. Um, people pretty much just equated them to calculators and that was the end of it. Um, oh, a lot of people did have cell phones back then, but not a lot of people splurged on getting these personal digital assistants. Nowadays, it's very ubiquitous that you keep something with you in your pocket. I understand that people did have laptops back then and people liked to bring their portable computers with them. But laptops were big at the time, they were bulky, they didn't have the processing power of a full-size computer or if they did they were very expensive and they became obsolete very quickly. They, the major problem that I always had with a laptop was, was even though it was portable, I never had a, I've never had a laptop with a decent battery. I get maybe an hour, hour and a half charge on one of those things, and granted, I haven't had a laptop in a long time, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that, that practical. And on top of that, this was before Wi-Fi, so it didn't have the capabilities. It was plugged into any wireless system, and, and there were no wireless antennas on the thing at the time yet, no cameras on them, that sort of thing. So bringing it portable would basically be I'd have to lug it around somewhere on a briefcase or something like that, hook it into a hotel phone line, dial up my, you know, look through my ISP phone book, get it, get it, you know, get an ISP number and dial, you know, dial them directly that way. It was still slow, it was still cumbersome, and it, it just, it wasn't, you know, it was basically like it was a necessity for traveling. When this became available to me, and I started using it, Wireless email anywhere in the country. I had access to apps. Granted, there were limited feature sets. I understand that. I was using other, you know, the software. Pro I was using software programs that were developed by the people that wanted me to visit their access. But I had access to things like the Yellow Pages. I had access to the news in the world. I had access to gaming news. Gama Sutra actually had their own dedicated app. I remember. Um, a lot of, a lot of, very, very common actually that it would have, that that sites would have dedicated pages, or at the very least, you could actually, uh, there were some apps that would actually be able to take pages, download headlines from them every time you synced. So it was really cool in that respect. I remember actually the Gama Sutra's uh, app at the time, uh, or their PalmNet program, something that they had used, it was, they when they updated it around the time of GDC that year, it put the entire schedule for GDC inside the program itself, so that you would have it downloaded into your PDA and be able to access it interactively. Even though smartphones have been around, probably since, well, smartphones pretty much have been perfected since about 2007 or so, I don't remember seeing apps like that for conventions until probably around two or three years ago at the latest. I just remember they had it for GDC back in like 10, 12 years ago or something. That was always really cool to me. So let's talk about the bad for a second. For people who may be wanting to be interested in finding some of these things. Well, let me tell you right now, if they work, they'll probably work like the day you first got them. Because in all likelihood, unless you've kept program synced or kept a battery in this thing for 12 years, in all likelihood, the memory on these things have probably long since been expired. Hopefully, you did keep the batteries out of them because it's not a good idea to keep batteries for extended periods of time in hibernation when you're going to put something like this into storage. You don't want to take the batteries out and leave them out because batteries can get corrosive over time and damage uh, electronic components. So if you're going to put it in storage, you're better off removing the battery and forgetting about it. The other thing I'll, you'll notice is, as I was showing the, the dock, this is a beautiful dock. I love this. In fact, I wish all smartphones actually came in a full-size dock. Um, 
if you want to dock for like an iPhone or something like that, they're available, they're custom, but you got to buy them separately, all they'll give you is a cord. Here, this is one docking device. I understand that it's a lot bulkier than just having a, a regular cable, but I like having docking systems. I really do. I prefer them. Um, the downside of this is, is that this is still using a serial, this is, this is basically using, I think this, I don't even think this is a serial port, I think this is a parallel port. This is using a COM port, which I'm fairly certain is not serial, I think it's a parallel port. Computers don't come with these ports anymore. I know what you're probably looking at, it's like, that looks like an old style, here, I'll show it to you, really up close. You're probably going to look at yourself and you're going to say, that kind of looks a little bit like an old style monitor cable or something like that, or a port that you'd plug a computer monitor into. You're wrong! <laughs> there were very similar amounts of ports like this, and the standard was at the time that uh, to differentiate this between uh, monitor cables, or uh, monitor cables, uh, analog monitor cables at the time, that the ports would be uh, male on the computer itself and the cables would be female. For monitors, it's the other way. The, uh, for monitor cables, or for analog monitor cables, um, they are male. They're male ports. Here, these are female. So this is a different type of uh, port entirely. Computers don't come with these ports anymore. Um, in most cases, um, the pin array is still there inside the motherboard for legacy purposes, but in most cases, most cases don't have um, a pin array for those ports. Um, you would probably get yourself a pin array to an adapter or something like that, third party, um, pretty easily, but that would take up an extra slot in your monitor case or your computer case. It's probably not a good idea. But they are still in the motherboard, and Windows still does use that call. The, the, it's still built into the uh, into the interrupt sequence because they just can't get rid of it. It's just part of the you know it's just part of how legacy systems worked. It's alongside you know um, how a diskette would be used or um, and by diskette I mean floppy diskette or the real time clock and stuff like that. It's part of those. It's part of that array. Uh, the thing is though, and this is important. <laughs> Uh, it will slow down your computer. Because it's part of those legacy things, whenever it's called forth, it probably will draw your computer down uh, performance-wise, which is probably why people have been saying the last couple of years, especially since Windows Vista Service Pack 1 came out, don't even bother having a floppy drive on those things anymore. It'll probably slow down your computer. It, it will. When the computer is using something like this, it'll be brought down to the transfer speed of this. I'd love to get my hands on a USB docking cradle that would be compatible with this, but the downside is, is that Drivers really don't exist on the new operating systems. There are still, uh, Hewlett Packard has archived the HP, I'm sorry, the Palm software so that you can actually download the Palm software to your computer that could actually sync a lot of these legacy devices. Most of the docking ports, uh, most of the so latest software was basically for Palm Prixie and Pixie and Palm Pre and stuff like that. But there is some hot sync software still available. I believe it's version 4.1 and 4.1.2 and stuff like that, which is for the legacy devices. The problem with that is, however, they only work up to Windows XP. I haven't tested them um, on Windows Vista or Windows 64. Uh, I'm sorry, Windows 7, and I certainly haven't tested them on Windows 64-bit. In fact, I remember that uh, some of them did mention, that even when they were compatible with Windows Vista, that they were having problems with 64-bit operating systems still. Um, so, if, you've got, if you're like me and you've got a 64-bit version of Windows 7, I'm going to have to start looking for a legacy you know, Windows XP box or something like that. Now, I happen to have one, so maybe if you guys want, I'll try to see if I can get a Palm Sync software running on it, you know, maybe for fun or some, or kicks or something like that. But, um, you know, that's the downside of this legacy stuff. It works, you know, and you can certainly get it working for kicks. Now this is probably one of my favorite peripherals for the device. It came in its own carrying case as well. This as far as I'm concerned, this design should be copied and used in pretty much every smartphone nowadays. So take a look at this right here. What does it look like to you? We don't know. It's a case. It could be something. It's peripheral, obviously. You'll put it on the tab. And boom. Foldable keyboard. Full size, too. All you got to do is just slide the keys in place on each side. They lock in place automatically, raise the docking port, 
and boom, you've got yourself a full-size QWERTY keyboard collapsible that will fit in your pocket. Why have I not seen smartphones do this? There are a lot of smartphones, I mean, Apple should make this for the iPhone. Is this, is this copyrighted? Is this patented design or something like this? I would kill to have a keyboard design like this that could be folded up like this. You know, with, you just slide it in, fold it up, locks in place. I mean, I've seen so many keyboard designs nowadays which are like either using red lasers or um, some other type of infrared tracking, kind of similar to how a, um, you know, a, a Kinect will track motion or things like that. But this is like, it fits in your pocket. It has perfect response time. It's tactile. It's the same size as a regular keyboard. Why is it that Apple hasn't made one of these things for an iPhone or an iPad? Um, I know they made a cover and things like that, and I know that there have been, you know, Windows phones have done like these cover pads that kind of have this whole, you know, this they may be like a slightly uh, leaner feel to them or it might be lighter, but I would take this design any, any day of the week over any of that design. I would prefer this because let me tell you something, this spoiled me and I've typed out emails with this thing back in the day. It worked perfectly. And for the sake of argument, let's see how well the keyboard in its carrying case, which it comes, which it came with, it wasn't sold separately. Uh, let's see how well this does in the pocket test. So I've already got the seven in my other pocket. Now I got the seven and the keyboard on me. Perfect. So the point is, even if I could get the COM port working and plug this thing in, I couldn't get the software to work on a modern 64-bit uh, uh, Windows 7 system. So, that's a bit of a problem. The other problem is, is that the majority of this thing that made it so great was the antenna and the Palm Net service. I love the Palm Net service. I could flip this thing up, I get connectivity anywhere I was in the country, and trust me, I brought this place all over the I brought this thing all over the country. It worked. I had no problems in Florida, I had no problems where I lived, I had no problems in California, I had no problems in um, Massachusetts and things like that. I, I had no problems. I was getting connectivity everywhere with the PalmNet service. I have no idea what they were using. But here's the great part about it. They shut it down in 2004. So even if I could get the apps and stuff like that loaded onto it, I wouldn't be able to use them because the PalmNet service no longer exists. So that's a problem. So, I don't know. It was a nice walk down memory lane to take a look at it, though, don't you think? And it's a lot. It was a lot of fun to be seeing that all this stuff actually still works. And I think that uh, devices like the iPhone or the Android owe a lot to what Palm had was able to do. I understand that there wasn't a phone; it, it didn't have a built-in phone. But this was way before that was technically feasible. Um, and if it was feasible, it would be very, very, very expensive. Some of the first smartphones that I've seen, and these were archived uh, messages and things like that, even though they had their own proprietary firmware for smart, you know, for phone purposes, when it came to doing things like email and other things, it used Palm software for the operating system for on the go. And I just thought, well, that just worked really well. I'm really sorry to see Palm go. I really am. I've got to admit that I wasn't too uh, impressed with the Pixie or the Pre. Uh, by that point, I already had an iPhone 3G by that point, so I figured it was when the Pre and the Pixie came out, it was just a bit too little too late. And I know that a lot of people were probably disappointed with the WebOS tablet that HP eventually released uh, that used uh, Palm software, the WebOS software. But, you know, such is, such is the advancement of technology. And... Um, like with anything great, it has its own. Um, it has everything has its own steps, and this to me was a big one. And I'm so happy that it actually still works. And one other thing is, I do think that uh, cell phones or smartphone providers could actually learn a lot from something like this. I wish I could see more of them actually being developed. This was actually a first-party Palm attachment. I'd love to see Apple develop something like this. 
um, I'd buy it in a second. I know that they do have like wireless keyboards or Bluetooth keyboards and stuff like that, but I don't know. I just like this whole collapsible keyboard design. It's solid. Uh, nowadays, like they're just they're just not. Oh, and uh, there was one other thing that I kind of wanted to show. If you had a problem reading the text, it actually had a night glow feature. And uh, trust me, this was actually perfectly readable when it came to uh, reading in the pitch black. So I, I always like that feature.